By now, I would hope that my YouTube audience have a firm understanding of the function of this channel, which is to pop by every 10 years or so, drop a hot take and leave again. Especially if those takes are surrounding a topic that I'm well versed in. You'll never see me drop a hot take about sports drama or auto mechanics or coding because I have absolutely no idea about anything in regards to those topics. But psychology and criminology, I spent 27 grand on a degree and I wrote an entire dissertation and by God will I milk that for all it's worth. But I will make it clear that I myself am not an expert. I was given the great honor of being educated by some of the best minds in this subject, but that doesn't make me a psychologist, a psychiatrist or a criminologist. I'm just heavily invested. Which is why I think it's important that when certain people online talk about certain subjects, they should also make those concessions as well. Let's take the topic of this video as an example. What do you think of when you hear the word cult? Cult is such a thought-provoking word. I would wager that many different images conjured in your mind were there just from hearing that one word. And I would also bet that the majority of those images were negative. Perhaps you thought of a charismatic leader, indoctrination, brainwashing and exploitation. But why and what even is a cult? Etymologically speaking, the word cult comes from the Latin calere, and officially the Oxford Dictionary defines cult as a system of religious veneration and devotion directed towards a particular figure or object. Throughout the years there have been many different cults that fit this description, but aren't compatible with the modern idea of what a cult is. Take for example the cult of Demeter. This was a cult founded in ancient Greece. The Eleusinian Mysteries were a series of rituals and ceremonies that were held annually to revere both Demeter and her daughter Persephone. If you didn't know who Demeter was, she was the goddess of agriculture and the harvest, mostly revered by, surprisingly, farmers. While the specifics of the exact rites were kept largely secret, we can guess based on other cult activity within the area and time period that the most they probably got up to was sacrificing an animal in the name of Demeter, hoping that she would bless their harvest. Nowadays, slaughtering a goat in the name of a god is probably frowned upon, but back then it was extremely common in comparison. It was a simple part of worship. If you want favour from a higher being, then you've got to spill some animal blood. It was a community endeavour, it wasn't held in secrecy. The meat would be eaten, normally at the ritual site, and also its skin would be taken to tan and leather and be used for other goods. It wasn't until the spread of Christianity that this practice died down. We look back on it and think, ooh, that's a bit weird. But then again, the majority of us are meat eaters, so I don't really think we have a leg to stand on. This section has been here to illustrate to you that there have been for centuries, if not thousands of years of history regarding cults that doesn't indicate the same thought pattern that we have when it comes to cults today, and they haven't universally been seen as negative. And there are cults today that are non-harmful, although a lot of them are referred to as sects which I will now explain to you. Sect, a group of people with somewhat different religious beliefs typically regarded as heretical from those of a larger group to which they belong. It comes from the Latin term sequi and the old French sect, literally just means following. But you'll notice that this definition also has no negative connotations. It merely denotes that they do not follow the majority. So, taking the definition for cult and sect, it seems like our interpretation of a cult is a combination of the two. A system of religious veneration and devotion directed towards a particular figure, which is the part of cult, and then also incorporating the definition of sect, meaning that the majority do not follow this. In the Menelassian section of the Pacific Ocean is an island country called Vanuatu. It is home to the Kastom people, and in particular for this video's sake, the villages of Yenanen and Yekel. These people believe in the divinity of Prince Philip, the late husband of the late Queen Elizabeth II. The 2022 documentary television miniseries Martin Clunes Islands of the Pacific depicted the titular actor and television presenter visiting these people and learning about their belief system. To simplify, in their mythos, their mountain god had a son who would travel west and marry a powerful woman. 
This prophecy existed well before colonization and any contact Vanuatu had with Britain. However, when they heard of the marriage of Prince Philip to Queen Elizabeth II, this was their prophecy fulfilled. They have since revered Prince Philip as the son of their mountain god. As discussed in the Martin Clunes documentary, in 2007 a handful of elders travelled from the village in Vanuatu to Britain to meet Prince Philip in person, one of the elders describing a spiritual experience when he shook Prince Philip's hand. Upon Martin leaving the village, they presented him with a carved staff in order to represent this relationship between the village and Britain. They also entrusted Martin with a message stating they knew that Prince Philip was old and wouldn't live for much longer, this being filmed prior to Prince Philip's passing, and that they hoped his successor, who would be King Charles, would take over his spiritual role. As stated prior, they're officially known as a sect, but they hold many similarities to a cult. They are venerating a single figure, Prince Philip, but they don't comply with many aspects of what we associate with cults. They aren't harming people. They literally just believe that Prince Philip is the son of their mountain god, and he's an idol to them. They're not out harming people or trying to force their beliefs on anyone. While they live communally, which is associated with cults, it's because they live in the same village and there doesn't appear to be any financial mistreatment, which is also associated with cults. So, when we get the idea of what a cult is, for example, a single charismatic leader living communally in some kind of financial mistreatment, where do we get that from? Why do we associate cults with negative things? And, as usual, we can thank the Americans for this. Robert J. Lifton wrote a paper, Cult Formation, in the early 1980s that described three primary characteristics of the destructive cult. One, charismatic leader. Two, a process of coercive persuasion, indoctrination. And three, some form of exploitation, whether that be emotional, psychological, financial or essay. Some people who read that paper must have seen the three primary characteristics, ignored the part where he said destructive cult, and then said, well, that's anything that doesn't have Jesus. Which quite frankly just follows a similar trend of missionaries going across the globe, seeing the native people and their spiritual beliefs and saying, no, have you heard of our Lord and Saviour? Which ironically would be a religion about a charismatic leader then following a process of indoctrination and exploiting them with the fear that they will end up in hell. But what really spurred this onward was the 1960s and 70s cult panic. For example, the People's Temple, which was active between the years 1954 and 1978, and the Manson family, active between 1967 to 1970. As well as Um Shinriko, which is a Japanese cult founded in 1987, which is somewhat still active to this day. I'll link videos down in the description going over all of these different cults because we do not have time to go in depth in them in this video. But there is one thing that is consistent with each of them. They were not governmentally recognised. At least, the latter, Um Shinriko, was no longer recognised by the Japanese government after 1995. And if you know anything about the case, you'll know why that was. So why am I bringing them up whatsoever? Because there is definitely a distinction between cults and recognised religion. And in this case, it seems to be recognition by the government, validity within the state. But Charlie, the reason why they're cults and they're not religion is because they harm people, look at the cases. That's absolutely true, they are destructive cults. But however, when we look at the term cult, these are the examples of cult we think of as opposed to traditional religion. Wayne Ingram quotes religion scholar Megan Goodwin in their podcast Study Religion when they state, cult is shorthand for religion I don't like. We default all cults to be destructive cults because we live in a Christocentric society. When we use the term cult, we are defaulting to a negative stance. Whether we're describing the new Prince Philip movement or the Manson family, one group does absolutely no harm and the other group did the most harm, but because they could both be described as cults, we have a stigma against them. And why do I describe that as a Christocentric problem? Well, because Jews. Within scripture, Jews do not accept Jesus Christ as the Son of God or the Messiah. They're still waiting for the Messiah to come, and in Christocentric societies, they were treated with great suspicion. 
blood libel was a thing. I'll give you an example. On the 31st of July, 1255, an eight-year-old boy called Hugh was found dead in a well. A single Jewish man confessed to being involved. 91 other Jews were seized in the town based on the fact that they were Jews and 18 of them were executed based on the fact that they were Jews because Judaism is suspicious. What do you mean you don't accept our Lord and Saviour? If you aren't worshipping Jesus, you must therefore be worshipping Satan. Pick a side, Jews. Jesus or Satan. And this wasn't a breakthrough case of anti-Semitism either. It dates all the way back to the first century CE in Greece. And some belief that Jews use blood to bake their bread? This anti-Semitic phenomenon was repackaged in the 1980s into the satanic moral panic, where people believed that politicians, priests, and other members of importance would go into the forest late at night and murder children while chanting. This is a debunked conspiracy theory wherein several of the experts who figureheaded the movement were found to have fabricated evidence, with one psychologist even having manipulated one of their clients into believing that they had undergone SRA. I have a video that goes in depth into blood libel and SRA if you would like to know more about it. And because we are Christocentric in the West, it means that most of the recognized religions will be monotheistic and Abrahamic religion adjacent meaning that most of the religions that aren't anything to do with Christianity or Abrahamic will be not classed as a religion by the government and will be an outlying religion, regardless of how many members there are. Shintoism, which is a Japanese-originated religion, has approximately 88 million members, but is not recognised within the United Kingdom. So, is it a religion, is it a sect, or is it a cult? This is all to say that the meaning of cult can change based on context, but when I look at YouTube and influencers, those who talk about true crime, they often always use the term cult in a negative context. The usage of the term is with the understanding that the audience already knows that a cult is a bad thing without having to use disclaimers such as destructive cult or criminal cult, which is what we should be using when we're talking about cults such as the Manson family and the People's Temple. They are cults, but they are more specifically destructive cults and criminal cults. And when we use the term cult in an exclusively negative manner, it means that we group them with all religions, spiritualities, sects, belief systems, whatever you may call them. This demonizes and stigmatizes many different belief systems that have absolutely nothing to do with the criminal or destructive cult. When you don't use the qualifying descriptors, you ostracize and stigmatize entire communities of people who have done absolutely nothing wrong in their entire lives, and this will target mostly non-Western Christocentric societies. And all of this amalgamates into an entire oppression of people who just don't believe the same thing as you. Don't believe me? In the Roman Empire, there was a tax on Jews for practicing Judaism. When colonizers, quote, discovered, unquote, the New World, Native Americans were kidnapped and indoctrinated into Christianity. And current day, there are re-education camps for those whose beliefs do not align with the state. Did you notice anything when I mentioned those examples? Yes, all of these were beliefs and religions that were not approved by the state or the majority that had power. Herein, we come full circle. A cult is a religion or belief system that is not approved by the state, is not followed by the majority, and is in contradiction to the majority belief system. And all of that leads to the stigmatization, which we now do by referring to all things that are foreign to us as cults. All of this history collides together with the research into cults started in the 1930s and reached ahead in the 1950s to the 1980s. All with the three characteristics of a cult that doesn't actually define a cult, it defines a criminal cult that everyone forgot about and now just refers to as all cults. Are you seeing how this could be possibly harmful to non-majority religions, belief systems and peoples? None of this is to say that destructive or criminal cults do not exist that would literally be denying history and the criminal cases that are very popular. What we should be doing when we're covering cult cases is making the distinction between criminal and destructive cults and cults. It's a very small, simple thing that we could be doing, but we generally aren't because we don't think that cults can possibly be good because of the erasure of the research that 
was there to distinguish between harmful and non-harmful cults. Cults are a major part of true crime which poses several ethical quandaries. Should we be covering cults, especially if they are still active and still have participating members? And my answer to that would be a solid no. The modus operandi of most cults aren't to end the lives of others, specifically their members. Hear me out. The Manson family did end lives, but that wasn't their primary objective. The Manson family's primary objective was to sow fear and distrust in the community and create a political statement. Ending the lives of those individuals was merely a means to an end to create that fear and divide. Manson himself probably wouldn't have found any joy in them because he was not present at the scene of the crime. When we look at cases on unalivings on a small scale, and by that I mean in a non-militaristic campaign, it tends to be a single perpetrator, maybe even two perpetrators, but it's very personal. And that's because the very act of unaliving is pleasurable to them. It's why they're present, it's why they commit the act. The motivations tend to be sexual, financial, personal in that regard. But if you send someone else out to do the job for you, it tends to be power that is the motivator. In the case of Jonestown with the People's Temple, the reason why unaliving occurred is because Jim Jones felt like he was backed into a corner. He never unalived someone prior to that point. It was only when a US official not affiliated with Jones visited Jonestown that he felt threatened and therefore ordered the act. And this case mirrors many others when it comes to criminal cult unalivings. Many criminal cults will unalive to gain power and others will begin unaliving when they feel they are losing power. This is what I refer to as the peak of danger for criminal cult members. They begin this process of eliminating their own members if they feel like they are in danger, which places the members themselves in danger, which is why you should never cover an active criminal cult. If their leader is free, meaning that they can have communication with members either in person or online, those members are in danger. If we're talking about criminal cults, tends to be an individual who has a lot of ego and damaging that ego is the most dangerous thing you can do. Like a cornered animal, the only thing they can do is lash out and fight back, but they won't use themselves to fight back. They already have a collection of members, they are willing to do that too. Please, make sure that a criminal cult leader is secured and away from their members before covering them. I will reiterate one of my tweets. Criminal cults are the most dangerous when the leader believes it's almost over for them. This is the point they take the most drastic action. Covering it without securing the leader and its members' safety is one of the most negligent things I've ever seen. Jim Jones only ordered the mass elimination of his members after he realised the United States was not going to protect him and he could be criminally implicated. Joko Asahara only ordered the attack on the Japanese subway system after a journalist began looking into him and researching his former victims. I will put it simply, if you cover a criminal cult and its leader, you place the members in more danger than they have ever been in. While criminal cult leaders already endanger their members, be it physically, mentally, financially or sexually, the point in which they feel threatened or cornered is the most dangerous they will ever be. It could be somebody's life in your hands when you decide to talk about this and cover this and threaten the leader without securing them. It is so dangerous, I barely have words for it. This video has been made to illustrate the importance of being accurate when describing criminal cults and how vital it is that we decide the timing of when we cover criminal cults. I hope this video was informative and I will see you in the next one. Bye.